hello and welcome to the show. I'm Joe Adams and you're listening to Slick Talk with Blackstone Laboratories. I am your host, Joe, and today I'm joined by Chris. Hello, everybody. Like myself, Chris is a senior analyst here at Blackstone Laboratories, and today we're going to be tackling a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of many of our customers out there, and that is BMWs and bearing wear. And and when it comes to BMWs and bearing wear, we mainly hear about it in a couple of engines. That would be the S65 used in the M3s and the S85 used in the M5s. Um, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. People have uh, certainly ran into some trouble with those bearings, and other people are worried about running into the same kind of issues. So everybody wants to know, is their engine going to be affected? And to head things off the pass, customers will send samples into us for testing, looking for bearing wear. And uh, Chris, just to get the ball rolling on that, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about how we find bearing wear, what kind of testing they need to look into, so on. Uh, so we look at bearing wear just like how we examine other wear from other parts of the engine. And that's primarily with the uh, spectrometer, looks at different elements that are found in somebody's used oil. Uh, so there will be just in the normal currents of uh, engine operation, microscopic wear put into the engine, and we look at those elements, in particular for the bearings, it'd be lead, and to lesser extents, copper and tin, and we look at essentially the amount of that element. Right, and we're looking at these things in relation to averages, um, averages for the engine type, and I think one thing that's important for people to keep in mind is that the averages are really a baseline to compare. Um, it's not the end-all be-all. So if you have some higher readings, um, we're going to look at our averages, but we're also going to want to see how trends build, right? Absolutely. Uh, as you said, an average is just one It's one piece of information, but there's a lot of other things that can go on, uh, you know, under the hood of your particular car, which can cause it to not wear exactly just like, you know, somebody else who's driving theirs a thousand miles away. And there's like a good reason, like often not like a harmful, you know, explanation for an engine not necessarily wearing like average, right? I mean, modifications, anything if you're adding power or if you, you know, you, you want to compare to average, but the fact is, is I don't really know what average use of an M3 necessarily is, right? Uh, yeah, we certainly some people like to keep theirs in their garage all year long and some people are out there on the track every weekend uh, and it makes a lot of sense that those two engines are not going to going to wear exactly the same. And I like you bring up the, the idea about some of them just basically being garage queens too because that kind of goes to another point. A lot of customers will think I've kept the oil in the engine for a year but I've only driven the car two, three track weekends but like the metals that we look for don't necessarily accumulate just due to calendar time. Um, they accumulate with use. If you're someone who's never tested before and you really want to make sure we know how much time is on that oil, that's all well and good. But really, the key factor we're going to consider is what is the actual use as far as miles, kilometers, if you want to track something else. That's really useful information to have on our end. Uh, yeah, in a similar vein, a lot of times people ask uh, when they should send in a sample. And and realistically, uh, you know, uh, most people we talk to kind of already have a set procedure. You know, say they change the oil every year or every 3,000, 5,000 miles, again, depending on the car and how it's used. Um, and realistically, as long as you think that, you know, have no strong suspicions that anything might be going wrong. Uh, I would typically recommend just pulling a sample at your next regular oil change. That way it's just kind of a normal uh, routine sample and kind of gives us an idea into how the engine is kind of wearing on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you have high readings in the first report, I think obviously the first thought in the customer's mind is where do we go from here? I have the high copper and lead that I've been told, shows a bearing issue, what's the next step? And I think the first thing as an analyst, what we want to do is look into all the potential explanations for these readings, right? Some of them uh, are yeah, not necessarily... It, it's a bit, from our end, it's a bit of a jump just to say that uh, wear is high 
uh, going from that to thinking that there's some sort of uh, mechanical failure that's, that's in the works. That's simply not always going to be the case. As we talked about, engines can wear uh, more or less than others, and just having a greater amount of microscopic wear metal does not necessarily translate to there being a serious defect. One thing that I think can kind of surprise people is the outside sources that can account for some higher readings. Um, specifically, one common one for you know an M3 or, or any car that's being taken to the track um, would be leaded fuel blow-by. And it's not necessarily always what customers expect because they might be adding track fuel that might not even say leaded on it. Um, I mean, to be fair, some of them explicitly say unleaded. Right. And, you know, we don't know where, if it's uh, regulations draw the line, but we've consistently, you know, found small amounts of lead in some of these fuels that are kind of race-oriented fuels that would be called unleaded. And the trace amounts are are really important because it doesn't take a whole lot to bring a metal such as lead outside the average range. So that's something to always consider if you're taking your car to the track, even octane boosters, yeah? Uh, yeah, and I guess just going back to the leaded fuel, uh, e- even if you may think that it's just kind of regular pump gas being um, used at the track, I've actually come across situations where the holding tank, say, at the track was at one point used with leaded fuel. So, you know, we're just kind of dealing with a, a similar issue where it's, you know, kind of cross-contamination where maybe no leaded fuel per se was put into your engine, but the the fact that it came from a container that was at one time holding leaded fuel, um, you know, maybe for other customers or something, could also lead to some, some high readings, I guess. And if you are totally confident that you have not used octane boosters, track fuel, either leaded, unleaded, even if the extra wear is indeed bearing wear, um, we're going to want to watch how that uh, situation changes over time. If you have two samples in a row with high readings, but they're consistent, then that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, Yeah, especially in terms of you know if we're just seeing one metal that's high, say it's just the lead. You know there there are other metals in those tri tri metal bearings, uh, copper and tin. So if it's uh, kind of a what you would see is a stable lead level that's say higher than average, you know, I would still consider that a, you know, a pretty healthy indication that there aren't any issues at hand just because we're not seeing high copper and tin which we would typically expect if some bearing was wearing through to the to the inner pieces uh, you know, beyond that babbit. And I think Really, what what can help customers out is um, when you start off and you're sending in samples, fill out the slip entirely, and that might seem like an obvious point, but really every every clerical detail we have serves a purpose, especially the year, just gauging bearing wear. Like we mentioned earlier, BMWs changed the metallurgy um, of these bearings uh, back in 2011 from leaded to aluminum. So if you just tell us you have an M3, for example, and you're curious about bearing wear, but you don't tell us any other information about the car, then that can kind of cloud the analysis from the start. And the funny thing about kind of that year change, I'd say, is uh, just kind of speaking to maybe how prevalent the issue is and in, in, in terms of or in relation to how much, say, feedback we hear about it, because we get a lot of emails, a lot of calls from BMWs. Uh, owners asking about bearing issues. But as far as I'm aware, you know, a, a lot of those kind of issues were taken care of essentially with the updated bearings in 2011. So, you know, uh, we will see those kind of samples from people with newer BMWs. These engines, you know, for all intents and purposes should be, you know, working and wearing as they should. Certainly doesn't hurt to be uh, vigilant, but I, I wouldn't have any kind of uh, underlying suspicion that, you know, something might have been, uh, say, misconstructed with the engine. Right, right. And really, I think when, when customers are, are testing and they, and they have um, samples they're sending in, at the end of the day, what's going to help them out the most as far as if they want to get the most out of the analysis, is just being forthright about use of the car, additives that you know you put in, whether you know if you're not sure they have anything to do with testing or not. People will, you know, even if you just put in a fuel additive, um, you didn't use any anything that's like a um, you know leaded. So yeah, I guess 
really what we're saying here is the moral of the story is if you're somebody who's be who either owns a BMW or thinking about it, uh, certainly we do see some pam- samples from people who are bought cars and um, looking to buy them. And you're concerned about possible bearing issues. Uh, really, all you can do is help us help you. Uh, give us that kind of information, um, any sort of feedback about how, how you think the engine has maybe been used, um, either for you personally or, like I said, if it, the previous owner, um, maybe the car has been sitting for a long time. That that can help us give us some insight um, actually into what to expect in terms of wear. And I would say also just learning how to trust the process or having the patience to trust the process when it comes to analysis and putting a file together. Um, Whether you have a great first report um, or a report that has some readings that don't look terribly good, we really learn a lot about your car when you sample it more than once. So if you have a great outcome and you still want to monitor how things are going, you know, we're going to have even more confidence that that your BMW and the bearings are in good shape when we see, you know, two, three samples in a row with really good trends. Um, if you have a sample with, with bad results, having, you know, having the, the patience to check back and see how things look from there can really do a lot as far as telling us if things are getting better or worse. Putting some data points together, even if it takes a few um, oil changes, can really do a lot just even for your peace of mind. And that wraps up our talk on BMWs and bearing wear. A big thank you to Chris for coming on to the show. If anything we covered sparked a question you'd like us to answer, either in an upcoming episode or just in conversation over email or phone, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. It seems like this seems about as good of a time as any to call it for a day. <laughs> <laughs>